Okay. Well, I think we'll get started. Stacy. if you can just keep letting folks in while we are talking, I wanna be respectful of time and give Dr. Gwen Westerman um, as much time as we can this morning. So hello this morning, this afternoon. So welcome everyone. I'm Heather Loglin, president of the St. Croix Valley Foundation. And on behalf of the St. Croix Valley Foundation and our generous sponsor and partner for State Bank and Trust, I am delighted to welcome you all faces both familiar and new to Conversations of the Valley. To help kick off today's program, I'm going to turn the screen over to Maggie, a student at the University of Minnesota and graduate of Stillwater Area High School. My name is Maggie Odomuiwa. Um, I'm 18 years old. I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, but I grew up in Nigeria. Um, I like to read. I like to write. Um, I like to sing because I think I sound good. Um, I went to high school. I went to Stillwater Area High School and I currently go to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. People have to fight to be able to be freely and are still fighting to be able to live freely while having this skin color and I think I'm very proud that people who look like me are such like strong people and like fought for these things so that I could be where I am today. Um, basically most of high school <laughs> Uh, it felt pretty bad because um, it was sad that I was treated differently for something that was out of my control completely. It's not like I just like chose to be black or chose to be a person of color. So that was definitely something that I felt throughout high school because I went to a predominantly white high school. So that was just something that was mostly constantly pointed out. There's a lot of things, honestly, that could have could be done to promote change. Probably, like stereotypes should be thrown out the window, and just assuming the worst of people because of the color of their skin is also something I believe should be taken out of society. Um, just believing the worst of people because they look different or are less socially accepted. lately seeing as like so many things are constantly happening so I've somewhat become numb to situations but um I just honestly hope for the best and hope that in the years to come things progress at least even a little bit more to where society isn't as unsafe as it kind of is now. Five years ago, a group of passionate citizens got together and decided that we needed a community foundation right here in the Valley, a foundation that would be focused on supporting the unique assets and needs of our region. From those conversations emerged the organization we now know as the St. Croix Valley Foundation. The mission of the St. Croix Valley Foundation is to enhance the quality of life in the St. Croix Valley. 
And we do this by encouraging and supporting charitable giving, connecting people and programs, and encouraging collaboration. So one way that we encourage collaboration is through convenings, bringing together individuals and organizations to find solutions to shared concerns. That is really what these conversations of the Valley are all about, getting people together to learn, talk, and think about how we might respond to some of the issues facing our region. The theme of this year's Conversations of the Valley series is racial justice, listening, and learning. After George Floyd's death last May 25th and the ensuing demands for racial justice, we took some time to reflect and ultimately landed on this theme of bringing diverse voices and perspectives to the Valley. It is our hope that this series on racial justice will bring the experiences of Black Americans and Native Americans more clearly into focus for all of us who call the Valley home. We started today's program with Maggie talking about her experience of race right here in the Valley. Throughout this series, we've been sharing videos of local youth. Our intention is to lift up their voices and show that racism is not just a national story currently centered on a high profile trial in Minneapolis, but rather it is pervasive from big cities to our idyllic river communities and it continues to impact our own youth and for our future. I know not all of us come to these conversations with the same experiences, perspectives, or opinions, and that's okay. To really begin to address racism, we need to start with ourselves, with being willing to listen and learn from others whose experiences are different from our own. Before I introduce today's speaker, a few words about the Zoom format for today's event. So first, to help keep things running smoothly, we have muted all participants. We suggest putting Zoom on speaker view so that the majority of your screen is filled with our speaker. However, if you're intrigued by who else is here today, you can go to gallery view and scroll through all participants. We will have time for questions at the end of our speaker's remarks. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat box in Zoom. You can access that chat box from the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Before I introduce Dr. West, Dr. Gwen Westerman, our speaker, a little interactive fun to help us get all of us thinking about the many language and cultural ties we share with native communities in this area. Would you please take a moment to answer the Zoom poll question on your screen? It's coming, really. <laughs> yeah. Is it there now? Okay, good. It is, Stacy. Thank you. Sorry about that. And once folks have responded, I believe Stacy's going to be able to share the responses with us. Is that right, Stacy? Yes. Did, did, goodness sakes. Okay, there you there go. go. So there's a county in Minnesota called Blue Earth County. What city in this county also means Blue Earth? And it looks like 58% of us know enough about Minnesota to know that city is Mankato, correct? Great, all right, thank you. So with that little teaser, I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gwen Westerman. Dr. Gwen Westerman lives in Southern Minnesota as did her Dakota ancestors. Her roots are deep in the landscape of the tall grass prairie and reveal themselves in her art and writing through the languages and traditions of her family. She is co-author of Minnesota Makote, Land of the Dakota, a history of Dakota land tenure in Minnesota, which won two Minnesota Book Awards, including the Hognander Minnesota History Award. Her scholarly research has been published in the Albany Government Law Review, Norwegian American Essays 2020, Migration, Minorities, and Freedom of Religion, 
and the forthcoming Indigenous Languages and the Promise of Archives. Dr. Westerman is the author of Follow the Blackbirds, a poetry collection in Dakota and English. Her poems and creative essays have appeared in When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a Norton Anthology of Native Nations Poetry, New Poets of Native Nations, Poetry Magazine, Waterstone Review, and A View from the Loft. As if all of this writing wasn't impressive enough, Dr. Westerman is also an award-winning visual artist and has an exhibit currently showing at the Hillstrom Museum of Art in St. Peter, Minnesota. Dr. Westerman is an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wapatan Oyate and has worked as a proofreader, a waitress, an editor, a sandwich delivery driver, a technical writer, and a teacher. Neither of her parents spoke English before they were sent away to boarding schools in Oklahoma and South Dakota. So Dr. Westerman says she knows the importance of the role language plays in who we are. Dr. Westerman, thank you so much for being here with us today to talk about the Dakota people of the St. Croix River Valley. We are ready to listen and learn. Welcome. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, Gwen Westerman, Amakiapie, Wununa Hamacha, Sisi Tuan Wakpe Tuan Oyate, Hemataha. Wana Wakian Washte, Otunwe, Dead Wahi, Dead Wati. I'm not just here, I live here. <laughs> so, um, it's good that all of you are here today. Thank you so much for the um, introduction. Um, sandwich delivery driver was a long time ago, not more recently, <laughs> given the current conditions of employment and pandemic times. But um, I want to share with you today um, some views about the St. Croix River Valley and how it came to be named. Um, the people who live here, the people who lived here, and uh, its importance in our Dakota culture and history. So with that, I will share my screen. If it makes you feel any better, there it is, green button, share screen. Okay. It doesn't matter how much I practice or how many Zoom calls I'm on, but I still stumble when it comes to this part of the, the technology. Um, so thanks for being patient. Um, I'm Yupia. Uh, it's a beautiful day and I'm really thrilled that I live in such a beautiful place and close to uh, a river. Um, this is the scene from my back door this morning. Um, spring, some people thought it was here last week, uh, but um, the weather had other intentions for us. Uh, the Maple River Valley is a travel way for beaver freshwater oysters or mussels for fish and birds. And in the last few weeks, I've seen uh, geese returning home, uh, ducks, uh, trumpeter swans, and my real sign of spring, the red-winged blackbirds. So I can't imagine that they're all happy now that they're covered with snow. <clears throat> But we know this place as an interconnected waterway, um, travel ways, because that's how we shared information, shared goods, um, moved from place to place. 
uh, riverways, waterways, travelways. Um, they bring livelihood and commerce from earliest memories of the indigenous peoples of this land. <clears throat> it also provides for us um, routes for seasonal migration um, and important waterways have helped us develop as a people, develop our culture, uh, develop our relationships with others along the riverways. <clears throat> so just to orient ourselves, um, down toward the bottom of the map where the M for Minnesota is. Um, I live just a little bit north of there. And um, it doesn't look like very far on this map, but it's a long way from the headwaters of the Mississippi and the St. Croix and from Lake Superior. This is known as Dakota territory in our stories, in our history. And Dakota territory um, ranged from the southern shore of Lake Superior to the Missouri River. And that's quite a broad expanse of the, the big woods, the prairies, and the plains. And uh, my auntie Carrie Schomer, uh, um, who's from Upper Sioux, told us a story at one time that she heard from her grandmother, and I'm sure her grandmother heard it from her grandmother, about um, big ships with big white sails coming along the big water of Lake Superior. And so these are memories, cultural memories, um, that are held in story about some of the earliest trading ships coming to the area. And we value those stories as connections to uh, the land, to the water, and uh, to our cultural knowledge. So by 1600, the year 1600, um, European trade goods had been circulating uh, among Dakota uh, people for about 75 years. And uh, it wasn't until 1670 that Hudson's Bay Company arrived in, in this area. But the Ojibwe and the Odawa people were the in-between traders for us, the, the middlemen who helped bring those European trade goods. Um, by 1760, uh, the Dakota people had begun to move west from St. Croix and uh, Lake Superior. Um, the St. Croix River in Dakota language is called Okiju Wakpa, a place where rivers uh, come together. And um, that's also known as uh, Bedote in a larger sense. And where two rivers meet, uh, where two rivers converge, that Bedote, that connection, is considered a special and powerful place, um, especially in terms of energy, in terms of water flow, in terms of um, power and commerce and trade. The Mississippi River in our Dakota language is called Wakpa Tonka, the big river. So we had maps of rivers beyond memory. Um, some of you may recognize this place from southwestern Minnesota. This is Jeffers Petroglyphs. And some of the markings here are uh, between five and 10,000 years old. So people were traveling through here um, for centuries. 
and they made their marks on the quartzite stone here. Um, most people are familiar with the, the hand prints uh, that are marked or animals, um, bison and antelope and deer and uh, fish and turtles, people, um, all images that are repeated throughout um, this area of uh, Jeffers petroglyphs. But in addition to those figures, there are also maps of rivers. And um, I'm not sure how many more years it's going to take, but um, we've got the images of those rivers and we're trying to match them up uh, to see uh, if we can identify them. But this was a place of commerce and trade. Um, major travel way that people were coming through and they left information here for others, including maps of rivers. The people knew these rivers well, uh, from the Mississippi and the Minnesota uh, to um, Michilimackinac, um, travel ways that connected people. Um, and Dakota people met the French and later the British at Mackinac Island. Um, and they were very familiar with those routes and working back and forth among those places. The Dakota people also drew maps on birch bark. And <clears throat> sometimes, um, stories and images from Hollywood seem to dominate our history. And um, <clears throat> what movies and TV shows leave out about our Dakota history is that we lived around Lake Superior, we lived around Mille Lacs, and um, we had birch bark canoes, we used birch bark to record messages, including drawing maps for explorers like Radisson and Hennepin uh, in the 1660s. And these maps showed the knowledge of the land and the rivers and networks of trade as well. Uh, when the Ojibwe followed their uh, prophecies across the Great Lakes to come to a place where food grew on the land, uh, which is wild rice, um, the Dakota were here. And um, Madeline Island in Lake Superior became a major trade hub um, for this part of, of the region. Um, there were wide networks of trade and communication among native peoples that crisscrossed the continent. And that's why we can find um, flint from out west. Uh, we can find um, abalone shells um, in um, places where people lived in the Midwest. Uh, so trade goods were coming from the west and from the east and um, those trade routes, those communication routes crisscrossed the nation as we know it today. So highly developed networks of communication, of trade, of commerce, and um, villages, stories about rocks that talk, um, stories about how landmarks were shaped, stories of important events that happened in places along these rivers, along the river valley. <clears throat> and the rivers were um, known as boundaries. And for us to move around, we followed those rivers. So you can think about how we follow rivers today and all of the um, roads and highways that follow rivers and come to places where rivers converge. <clears throat> the, 
the way people gather um, and want to live near rivers and live near water, I think is part of that um, human desire to, to be near water. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in addition to maps, <clears throat> we also have images by explorers and travelers of the Kota villages along these rivers. And this is uh, an image from the mid 19th century of uh, Ta Oyate Duta's village in 1848. So you can see birch bark lodges uh, along the river. You can see the bluffs um, here where the Mississippi and the St. Croix come together. So a lot of documentation about the importance of these travel ways and these waterways, um, how we knew the rivers as well as uh, we know the major highways and streets that we travel today. And I kind of hesitated when I started to say that because most people use their um, cell phone apps or the apps in their cars that can get an address and tell us exactly how to get there most of the time. Um, so we don't rely as much on maps today as we used to, physical maps, or a clear connection to the land itself. And um, I think about uh, people who live in, in big cities and leave their apartments, walk on a sidewalk, go to their office building, uh, walk along the sidewalk, or get in a car and drive or ride, and <clears throat> how their feet never uh, touch the ground or rarely touch the ground. Um, and the loss of that physical connection to a landscape, to place, um, to hear rivers uh, rushing in the spring, um, to see the change in seasons along a river, um, especially as beautiful as it is in the St. Croix River Valley. Um, I was trying to find an image of spring uh, along the St. Croix River Valley and it was all flowers and green grass. So that's why I shared <laughs> the snow along the, the Maple River today instead. Um, thank you. <clears throat> My assistant brought me water. But that, that loss of connection to place and um, how highways and factories and mills um, have, changed, have changed the course of rivers, have changed the quality of water, have the, that industry has uh, changed the landscape so that we have flooding and loss of soil. Um, and our connections, our personal connections to that, that place have been diminished um, as we, we spend more time driving and um, working in large cities, small cities. Um, we don't often look at what's around us. And one of the things that um, makes my family nervous when I drive is that I'm always pointing to things in the landscape. Um, you know, look up there, there are two eagles flying above us. Or look over here, there are wild turkeys along the tree line. Um, but I do maintain um, 
focus on the on the highway, but I'm always watching along the periphery and above to to have that connection to a place, to the river, to the bluffs, um, to the landscape. These places uh, that we drive past daily also had names in Dakota. Um, the rivers had Dakota names. The tributaries, the marshy lands, places where um, people had gathered and lived for a long time. Uh, some of those names still exist today, but most of them have been replaced. So these places had Dakota names, <coughs> and then some of the Dakota names were replaced by Ojibwe names, then French, then English. Um, and I often wonder um, how that changes the way we relate to a place when we don't know its previous name or its original name. Um, how would we think about these places if we knew that and understood that people had lived here uh, for centuries beyond most of our collective memories and that there are stories about the landscape, stories about the river, rivers um, that are in danger of being lost uh, forever as a dominant narrative takes over. This idea of trade and commerce and travel uh, was part of daily Dakota life. Um, stories of fishing, of gathering wild rice, uh, even as far south uh, as the Minnesota River close to where St. Peter is today, uh, there was wild rice um, and Dakota people were gathering it this far south. Um, so there are, are names of places that tell stories of the people who live there, of special events that happened, of um, sea creatures, water creatures, of um, battles, conflict, of peace and cooperation, um, all in the place names of the landscape around us. Confluence a place of power, Medote. Um, this is the confluence of um, the St. Croix and the Mississippi. And I suspect you can guess which one is the Mississippi. <laughs> uh, they call it the muddy Mississippi all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, I think. But this is a powerful image where we see two flowing rivers come together. Um, and then what also interests me is the bridge, the old bridge, the new bridge, the docks, and all of the industry right around this confluence of rivers. Um, a powerful place, a place where people gather, even today. Um, another bidote um, is the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi rivers. And you know, when you think about a transportation hub, when you think about a place of power um, where Dakota and Ojibwe, uh, Odawa, Ho-Chunk peoples, Iowa and Fox peoples met in this place, at the confluence of the Mississippi and the uh, Minnesota rivers. Uh, that's where Fort Snelling is. 
Minneapolis, St. Paul, airport, uh, all kinds of trucking and train and grain and barge industries all coming to that, that place where those two rivers meet to extend that travel way, to extend that connection um, among communities, among uh, cities, among people. So that idea of following the rivers, um, like the old cliche goes, there's nothing new under the sun, um, it has been a waterway, a travel way for uh, indigenous peoples beyond memory. I like looking at this um, one because it's green. <laughs> But two, because there are just so many stories in the people, in these little boats, in the cars, in the trucks, in the buildings, in the houses, uh, stories about the river, stories about their connections to this place, um, important stories that we all have, especially when we are deeply connected to a place. So the confluence, Travel ways, waterways, commerce ways, places to gather, gather and share. Um, from Lake Superior all along the St. Croix River Valley, um, the timber that's in that area that was so important to um, the people who lived here, the Dakota and Ojibwe people who valued that uh, valued those trees, valued that landscape, uh, and the people who live there today and value it, uh, especially for its beauty. So I'm going to read a poem for you. Um, it's not for the St. Croix River, but it's for the Mississippi River and uh, all of the things that come from that. Um, I hope to be inspired by the St. Croix River Valley, Madeline Island, and Lake Superior as well uh, to um, keep writing about water and rivers. Uh, for Dakota people, water is our first medicine. It's what gives us life. And um, so there are lots of songs and prayers for the water. This is called Dewak Pa Tanka Odawa, Song for the Mississippi River. Long before Louisiana woman, Mississippi man, before Old Man River, before Wade in the Water. Long before Schoolcraft and Veritas Caput, before Father Hennepin and St. Anthony, before Mississippi, long before Hernando de Soto, O Tokahea in the beginning, De Dakota Makoche. This was a Dakota place. The water was pure. The water was wakan, sacred. Meni pejuta tokahea hecha. Water was, water is our first medicine. The water was part of the land, therefore part of the people. And in this place, we flourished from Bedote, where the Minnesota Wakpa joins the Wakpa Tonka. We followed the rivers, interconnected waterways, interconnected lifeways. Itoka Rata, southward, the Cheminichan, and Bede Ishtamani, the Lake of Tears. Waziata, northward, 
The big river took us to Owamani Omani, the whirlpool created by Ha Wakpa, the curling waters of the falls. We knew the rivers rise and fall, channels and gorges, every meander, every floodplain from Badea Wakan to Maniti, Malax to the Lake of the Woods, Rainy Lake to Thunder Bay, where our burial round, mounds remain. Weohfeata, westward to Saskatchewan, the head of the Churchill River along the Ballantine River, called Puatsipi by the Cree, Dakota River. These were our waterways and our lifeways, our medicine. And we too want to sing a song for the water, a song for Wakpa Tonka. So we listen. We listen, listen, and then on the edge of a dream, the songs come. Condensed from the fog like dewdrops on cattails, they form perfectly clear. Whispering through leaves, heavy voices rise up, drift beyond night toward the silent dawn and sing. Always on still morning air, they come connected by memories, connected by water, connected by song. Wopida Ota, many thanks. I'm grateful to you all for being here today to uh, share a story about Dakota travel ways in the St. Croix River Valley. Dr. Westerman, thank you so much. Um, we do have some time for questions. So if you, um, those of you who are watching, if you have questions, please put them into the chat box. I already see one, Gwen, that was leaning the way I was, which was appreciating this history and wondering, okay, so what happened between then and now? How, how do, do the Dakota people who are now in this region, how are they relating to and, um, you know, using those, those pathways, those waterways. Uh, someone specifically asked in the chat about um, the loss of the white pines um, when, when once English settlers came. So I realize we don't have time for all of that history, but just a little sense for how, for how contemporary Dakota people, how, what this looks like for them now, this connection to the waters and these travel ways. I can't speak for all Dakota people, um, but um, there are Dakota and Ojibwe people who are making it their life's purpose to uh, protect the water, um, the, the water walkers who start at the source of a river and uh, every day they say prayers, um, they carry the water from the headwaters to a confluence, um, they've walked <clears throat> oh my gosh, um, all throughout the, the upper Midwest uh, to bring attention to um, what gives us life, water, um, and to protect the water, to pray for the water so that it will heal and that other people will become aware of what will happen to us if we lose our water or our water becomes hazardous to our health. Um, and um, I admire the water walkers 
Um, you know, it's not easy to walk 20 miles a day, uh, to carry water from one place to another place, uh, to bring attention to these issues. So that's one way. I think that Dakota and Ojibwe and other indigenous peoples are, are maintaining that connection to these important waterways. Dr. Westerman, there was a question in the chat about kind of, so what did happen to the Dakota people when Stillwater started to be populated and grew and Prescott and these other cities, where, where did they go? Um, what, what happened to that, cult, that nation and their culture? Um, by 18... 51, um, the, the land base for Dakota peoples uh, with, in the territory of Minnesota uh, had been diminished significantly to 10 miles on the, either side of the Minnesota River from um, Big Stone Lake um, to uh, St. Peter, uh, Minnesota. Um, and that was the treaty agreement that was made in 1851. And Dakota people were supposed to move into a relatively small area compared to where they had started out uh, 10 miles on either side of the river. Um, the treaty wasn't ratified until 1858. And by that time, the federal government had reduced the land holdings to the 10 miles um, on the south side of the Minnesota River from just west of New Ulm up to Big Stone Lake. And um, that's not enough space to, to sustain life and culture. Um, and it created a lot of hardships. Uh, there was a, a, an attempt to get Dakota people to farm even though uh, people, Dakota people had been farming from time immemorial, um, they cultivated crops along the, the Mississippi River, along the Minnesota rivers. Um, they had seasonal rounds of migration. So that in summer, spring and summer and fall, they were near the rivers with their cultivated plots. And then in the winters, they moved to more uh, sheltered areas. Um, but we're still here. Mm -hmm. here. There are four Dakota communities in Minnesota uh, at Upper Sioux, Lower Sioux, Shakopee, and uh, Prairie Island. And then only 25% of, of Native people in the United States live on reservations. The, the other 75% of us live everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Westerman, there are several comments about um, expressing an interest in, in finding original names for, for, uh, for rivers and tributaries, for places, uh, recognizing that um, probably most notably near us that um, Lake Calhoun was recently renamed. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, first of all, the question was, where can I go to find out more about these these names, and I know when we had a chance to connect prior to today's session, you rattled off a whole bunch of place names that I wouldn't have known were Dakota names and, and, and are, um, but if folks are interested in that, both in the knowledge part, but also perhaps in the, um, the advocacy part about renaming or, or um, I guess, returning to original names, um, any suggestions for them? I think there are, are uh, an a few good sources. One of them is uh, called, um, I don't know how, how easy this book is to, to get. It's called Where the um, Waters Gather and Their Rivers Meet. Um, and it's, it's a, this is 1994. Um, that's a good place to start. It has Dakota and Ojibwe and sometimes um, Odawa and, um, Ho-Chunk names in there as well. Uh, another place is to look at um, early maps um, because they often record the, the indigenous names for places or they will mark where um, indigenous villages were. And um, Stardutcher County Historical Society 
Oh, I think that's a good place to start. Great, thank you. Um, switching gears a little bit, a question about what it means, um, what, what the appointment of our new Secretary of Interior might mean for uh, Indigenous folks in this region. Where do I start? <laughs> um, it's hard to express what it means to be connected to a place. Um, I don't know how many of you go to uh, um, your grandparents' uh, homestead or the place where you were born or the place where your grandparents lived um, or come to a place you've never been before and feel immediately connected to that place. Somehow it speaks to you, to your heart, to your blood, to your bones, and, and you, you make a connection with a specific place. Um, for, for me to have um, Secretary Holland head up the Department of the Interior means that we don't have to keep explaining over and over again why these places are important to us because there's somebody right at the top who already understands that and we can begin to um, talk more about how we all work together not just indigenous people but everybody who loves this land these places uh, how we can all work together to protect them, to um, keep them safe um, when there's discussion of development. Um, there are ways to develop land without completely destroying it. Um, so it cuts a lot of the explanation that we have to provide every time we go to the Department of Interior with a concern or with a request, um, because we've got somebody at the top who already understands that. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm glad I'm living in this time to see, to see her appointment as Secretary of the Interior. And, and um, Dr. Westman, someone put into chat FYI, that um, Deb Holland's dad was a Norwegian Minnesotan. Is that is that accurate? So so local local connections, even though she's um, in another part of the part of the country. Um, there were a couple of questions about connections of of, um, of 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 what you've talked about to writing. So someone asked about the writings of Al Alpo Leopold, the Round River. Does that resonate with Dakota wisdom? Someone else um, talked about your emphasis on on being present. And, and is to what's in front of us, below us, above us, and asked, is that a value that's rooted in Dakota traditions? I'm not familiar with Leopold's work. So you'll have to send me the information and I will check it out. Um, I think to be rooted in a place, to be connected to a place, and to be aware of what's around us is an important part of what I know as a Dakota person, as a native person. Um, but I think it's not exclusive to indigenous people um, in, in this country. I think there are lots of families who share that that love and that connection to a place. Um, and, you know, I think if more of us got outside, <laughs> if more of us walked the trails along the St. Croix River Valley or the Mississippi River Valley or just the park, um, I think um, we would be healthier not only physically, but mentally. I think we would become more aware of how much we are part of an 
a system. We as human beings are not at the top of a pyramid. We are part of an interconnected system. Um, and I think when we're not outside, when we're not in a place, we don't go to a place that takes our breath away, whether it's um, the boundary waters and seeing more stars than we've ever seen in our lives. Um, I think we, we lose a connection not only to the land, but our ability to connect with each other as human beings. Well, Dr. Westerman, I would echo the comment of one of our attendees who um, I'll paraphrase, basically said I could listen to you all day, that your voice and your words are so soothing. So thank you. I wish we'd had more time for you to share to share more of your writings. Um, you know, I think when you said um, something about we all have stories and, you know, even as you're talking about history, you were looking at that contemporary photo of Prescott from the air and wondering about the people on those, on those river boats and the people in those cars. Um, you said we all have stories when we are deeply connected to a place. And that really is um, at the heart of what we do at the St. Croix Valley Foundation is that we work with folks primarily who have deep connections to this place, whether it's the valley as a whole or um, one of the smaller communities in our valley working with our affiliated community foundations. So um, I, I'm guessing I speak for many of us on the, uh, many of us on this call when I when I say um, that this really resonated. So so thank you so much. Thank you so much for your for your time today and for sharing your um, your 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 this history and your own your own, uh, your own knowledge. I appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank, say thank you again, again, our partner and sponsor, First State Bank and Trust. We are looking forward to our next Conversations of the Valley event on Wednesday, May 19. And we will have um, Alexis, and I should have figured out how to pronounce this name, um, Pate, author and president and CEO of Innocent Technologies, talking with us about eliminating the power of racial stereotypes through authentic relationships. I hope you plan to join us. Um, and if you're not sure where to go to learn more about these types of efforts, please pay special attention to the email you'll receive after today's event. It will include a link with some resources related to today's event, including um, a link to a recording of Dr. Westerman's remarks and, and a discussion guide. So we encourage you to use that to facilitate continued discussion and conversation about today's presentation. Uh, if you're new to these events and to the work of the St. Croix Valley Foundation and would like to learn more, please visit our website, www.scvfoundation. Uh, email us at info at scvfoundation.org or give us a call. Thanks again for joining us today, all of you. Dr. Westerman, thank you so much for your time. Be safe, be well, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.